I'm not here to tell people that they need to cook every single meal of their lives, home cook it, that's ridiculous. But I do think that for a few months, Cook90 sticks with you and you will become a better cook. And when I realized, like, oh man, I just spent the entire week eating these disgusting hard-boiled eggs from the Kanye West cafeteria again, I know how to get back on track because I've done Cook90. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hiesel. Today on the show, we have David Tamarkin, Editor-in-Chief of Epicurious and the author of a new cookbook, Cook 90, the 30-Day Plan for Faster, Healthier, Happier Meals. Also on the show, we have Diane Chang, the owner of Paw Paw, a Brooklyn-based catering company inspired by her grandmother's Chinese cooking. Matt, what did you and David talk about? Oh, David Tamarkin is one of my guys. He's, he's, he's a longtime friend. I knew him when he was uh, a producer on the first iteration of Queer Eye. He's also been the uh, a restaurant critic working at Time of Chicago and covering the Chicago restaurant scene. But he's now the editor-in-chief of Epicurious and is out with a really cool cookbook, Cook 90, which basically prescribes uh, readers to cook 90 meals over the course of 30 days. Did he invent this? He did invent this. It's a, it's a, his own, his own doing. Um, but I like it because it allows readers, it gives them this kind of inspiration to cook all the time, which ultimately makes you a better cook. It, it's, it's really that simple. You slice your shallot five times a week, you're going to be better at it by the end. Here's Matt talking to David. David Tamarkin, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Thank you. Oh, man, I love having you on here. You're my old friend. We go back a ways, right? 10, 15, 10 or 15 or 15 20 years. years. <laughs> I met you. You were Post working. Post-college. I think before it, you were in food. Yeah, it was. I was doing other things. Um, you worked on Queer Eye? Yes. OG Queer Eye. Like yeah. the OG. Yes, yeah. Which is a great version of Queer Eye. The new version is also great. What were you doing on Queer Eye? That was so funny. So I want to tell you how I got on Queer Eye, which is a sort of an interesting story. And it puts Ted Allen in a really good light. Not that he would be He's a great bad, guy. Yeah. Not that he wouldn't be in a bad light. But um, I, I'm Midwestern, and I'm obsessed with Chicago as a kid. We would take road trips to Chicago. That was my uh, vacation from Ohio. And um, I was in New York because, you know, there was a boy here, and all my friends had moved here, and blah, blah, blah. I was working at CBS Radio. What I really wanted to do was move to Chicago and start writing about food. And I just called up Chicago Magazine one day and I was like, hey, do you have any jobs? Do you, do you need restaurant critics? And the receptionist literally laughed on, laughed at me and hung up the phone. And so I joined this uh, professional group, uh, the, uh, what is it, LG. J B L G B G uh, anyways, the Lesbian Gay Journal Association, okay. which I, uh, after like trying to get a job, and Ted Allen was in there, and he is, maybe he still is, but at the time he was at the mass, on the masthead of Chicago Magazine, and he had done restaurant criticism mm-hmm. for them. And Ted is a great writer. A lot of people don't know this, but he's an amazing writer. He's won a National Magazine Award for a story about uh, male breast cancer for that for Esquire a while ago. And, um, you know, he was in this database, and with his email, I just emailed him and I said, hey, I know you're on some TV show, which I don't think I'd seen. And I was like, I'm not emailing you about that. I'm emailing you about Chicago Magazine. I really want to move there and and write about food for them. And he wrote back maybe like an hour later and said, David, don't move to Chicago and write about food for (laughs) Chicago Magazine. Come to Queer Eye and work with me. I was like, okay. So I did. And so he never met me. Of course, I like went in, I had like an interview or two, but basically it was like Ted said, Hire this guy. He liked that you were asking about a real journalism job and not like... Because that show was big at the time. It was probably bigger than it was even now. I mean, with broadcast so television, big. it was huge then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got the job. What kind of work were you doing he at Queer was, Eye? Yeah, he just liked magazine people. You know, He yeah. liked print people. He, he wanted to find himself. It's so different. I don't know if you've ever worked in TV, but TV people are so... You know that. It's very, very just different mentality. Not, it's not good or bad. It it's is just, bad, it's just different. actually, David. I'm going to say <laughs> I, I hated... See, I'm trying to be diplomatic. You yeah. are, but I worked at... Uh, several core TV, MTV. I worked at Fox News, and I just couldn't get be. I couldn't get my head around the fact that these people don't write ever. They can't write. They they couldn't write emails. Yeah. So sorry. sorry There's TV sort people. of a lack of thoughtfulness <laughs> in television. 
And I don't this know. is your media criticism podcast of <laughs> right, the day. Right, right. I'm not trying to criticize media right now because I'm trying to like get on TV to yeah. promote this book. So, uh, but once all that's over, I'll be back to criticizing no. TV. Uh, on Queer Eye, I on Queer Eye, I was the director of research, and which meant I just told the guys what to say when they didn't know what to say. <laughs> some of them knew exactly what to say; they didn't need my help. And some of them needed a lot of help, and I'll just let you. If you remember, there were, it was kind of very clear who it was. Oh favorite. man, I have my favorites. Car- yeah, definitely Ted was a favorite. So, have you met Anthony, the new food guru on the new season of? Yeah, Fair I Eye? met him once because my good friend Mindy is uh, writing his cookbook with him. Let's talk about some other things related to Cook Ninety because I really wanted to dive into the idea of repetition because you have a number on there which is ninety, which means ninety meals in one month. Let's, we can get into what Cook 90 actually means and the structure of it. But I really wanted to start by asking you, like, how does cooking a, many meals a month, what does it do? I mean, it obviously will make you a better cook, but that's like a pretty much a generalization I'm making. What does cooking 90 meals a month do? It's a really good question because it's a hard sell. I mean, 90 is a big number, as you say. It's triple the... Uh, the popular number on cover of books, which is, you know, 30. Um, and repetition is a... I, I've never actually thought about it in terms of repetition, but I think that's a good way to think about it, and I think that gets at what uh, some of the benefits are, which is just general health. So my feeling is, is that cooking is a healthy behavior, and I don't care what you cook. If you mostly cook cupcakes and you throw in, you know, some pasta in there, I, I don't really care. I think <laughs> you're still going to get some... some Health or if you cook like half from scratch and half from the box, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm not. I don't care what you cook or how you cook it. Um, the repetition is important because what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do with this book and trying to do with the whole Cook Ninety movement, is get people to cook more because I, I'm sure you know cooking is um, is dying in, in just in the. I was going to say in this country, but really worldwide. I um, just just fewer and fewer people cook every year, and I think that's a sort of a dangerous situation because of not just because of the health benefits that you get from cooking but because you know when the apocalypse comes we're gonna have to like learn how <laughs> we're gonna have to know to how to like sear a piece of meat rub right? those two pieces of stick together and cook a steak right and, and cook right but it's gonna be like the arm of your like <laughs> your your friend who you're gonna eat well, this is good yeah, I, yeah. that joke cannibalism didn't, is not that joke part didn't of really plan. land but anyway okay so to make it a challenge and to do it to make it 90 meals in one month and cook, 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 cook was very um, intentional because what you're trying to, what we're trying to do is just build a habit and to find out how cooking fits into your life. And I just feel that if you take a month and you just you do it, it you force it in, yeah. you, you kind of get a sense of where it fits in naturally and where it doesn't. And then at the end of the month, the uh, places where it doesn't fit in naturally, you just let that go. Yeah, you go out and grab sweet green right. or chopped, I'm not going to take a brand. But, of salad bar <laughs> company, but you yeah. you can go out and but get your lunch sometimes, right? Because if you just, if you're if you realize that hey, I can I can cook my breakfast that was easy and that was beneficial and I liked that and I can do dinner, but lunch is just too much of a hassle. I hate you know dragging my you know yeah. bento box in every day and day out. Um, and some people love that. Though. Yeah, some people love that, oh, and some people and for some people a lot of people breakfast is going to be the thing. And I really encourage people to, to make their own coffee at home. And for that, I know a lot of people are going to be like, no, I'm just. Screw that! I'm going to go to Blue oh, Bottle uh, or Starbucks. You know, make your own coffee at home. Buy a forty dollar Chemex. I mean, it, do it. You will say, and that's really that's where you're going to see the um, most money savings. I think is with breakfast and lunch, and that's that was really one of the main reasons why I started doing this because I was looking at my debit card, uh, you know, receipts and seeing that I spent most of my money at the Connie Nast cafeteria. And that, no, dis- no disrespect to Kanye Nast, but that food is not good. It's still Cisco. Yeah, I mean, yeah, seriously. And is not Anna Wintour is probably not eating the Kanye Nast cafeteria, but most of the people are eating Cisco branded shit. Yep. Um, but I love the idea of Cook Ninety being being an opportunity to try new recipes. Give us a recipe or two that you really are proud of. I mean, you the book is chock full of them, but what do you what do you really want to tell us about? I really like the cover recipe, which yeah. is a sweet potato with a chorizo. Um, and Greek yogurt and cilantro. Oh, and there's mushrooms in there too. So basically what you're doing is you're kind of rendering the chorizo and then frying up some mushrooms in that chorizo fat, mm-hmm. cilantro, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's one of the next over recipes. So it fits into one of the main concepts of the book, which is where you make something like a sweet potato. If you're going to roast one sweet potato, you may as well roast six or seven or however many, depending on your household size. Like for my 
household, two people, two boys who eat a lot, I'll do six at one time because I'm going to do one. I'm going to do six. No, and, and then I'll have them in the fridge for lunch. Yeah, lean up with lunch or or kind of my friend Lucas Volger like loves putting them in his oatmeal for breakfast. Yeah. But the idea is you cook it once and then uh, you have it again to turn into a completely different meal uh, a couple of days later. So. This, I believe, is the first of the next overs where you, you're roasting this and you're doing this with the sweet potatoes. And then with the next over sweet potatoes, you're doing a coconut curry with chickpeas and sweet potato. I love next over. Yeah. That's, that's a, a cool it, term. It's a good ner- yeah. I didn't create that term. My friend and coworker Rhoda Boone, who styled the recipes, yeah. uh, styled the uh, photos. Yeah, shout out to Rhoda Boone. She's great. And She's I amazing. Think she, that's a really smart way of calling leftovers next overs because clearly you can make full meals out of it. And leftovers kind of have a bad rep because they, yeah. cause, I mean, nobody wants them. I mean, just the just the word. I mean, there's no good association with leftovers. I don't think it's because it feels like a sad, cold thing that you didn't really yeah. something you didn't finish. But this is you're really intentionally making more, and the key is you're making something different with it. Uh-huh. And I, leftovers play a big part in Cook Ninety because you know you need leftovers if you're going to eat home cooked food every day. You can't do it without relying on leftovers for lunch, for breakfast, whatever. But for dinner, I kind of want something new. You want something new. And let's talk about once you're done with your, your 90-day plan, what, it, what what is the prescription then for the next couple months? I mean, are you then doing half your meals at home? I mean, what what, what what's the next move? Because I think this clearly isn't just a one-month like cleanse or boot camp, right? You want to start cooking more after reading this book. The book, the plan just dictates that you do it for one 30-day period. Oh, sorry, one month long period. At Epi, we do it every year in January. We did it in May once we did a spring cook 90. And it was, I will be very honest, it was much harder because when the weather is nice and it, it's just... You want to eat chips like, and salsa. You want to eat chips and salsa, right? You want to hang restaurant. out. You want to like, just be lay, laying in the park. Yeah. Um, but I will say this. Every time I do cook night at the end of January, uh, and this will be my fourth January doing it, mm. um, I think I'm going to like... February 1st is going to come and I'm going to run to, you know, wherever, like the ramen place down the street and just eat right. out all day and just be done with cooking. But I don't. I mean, I, I cook, I probably cook 90 for about two more weeks because, you know, it's just sort of in me. It's in my bones. And that's sort of the point is that you just get cooking in your bones. It's in your life. You're on the schedule. You have the, the habits next are over. Is going Right. The habits are formed. Yeah. And then you do have to like, you have to be intentional about all this. You, you, it will go away. And, you know, like I said, in the summer, it's harder to cook every day. And I'm... I'm not here to tell people that they need to cook every single meal of their lives, home cook it. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But um, I do think that for a few months, Cook 90 sticks with you yeah. and you will become a better cook. And um, you also know how to get out of that space, like what, like that non-cooking space, which I get into a lot. Like when I realize, like, oh, man, I just spent the entire week eating these disgusting hard-boiled eggs from the Kanye West cafeteria again. Yeah. I know how to get back on track because I've done Cook 90. Yeah. And, and there's a book now I can now just reference. I can just read the book. Let's talk about Epicurious because on top of, in addition to being the editor, or being the author of Cook 90, you're the editor-in-chief of Epicurious, which is a, an amazing resource for recipes and editorial features. I love that. I used to write for Epicurious before Taste. Yeah. So tell me... What were some of the p- most popular recipes this year that maybe we're surprised about? I mean, you have many, many millions of recipes, literally. Yeah. What were they? I'll tell you a recent one that's popular that yeah. very, very much surprised me. It was very controversial in our office, which was a sheet pan pancake. Uh, so we have a vertical on Epicurious called Small Plates, which is for kids. Uh, well, for parents, cooks who have yeah, kids. cooking for uh, children. Families that have kids in the house. And Anya, who is the, you know, the sort of lead on small plates, said she really wanted to get a sheet pan pancake on site. We didn't have it. It's very surprising, by the way, when you look at, you know, when you find the holes in our database, because it's 25 years old and we have all the Bon Appetit recipes, all the gourmet recipes. Uh, anyway, so we're, we're trying to, you know, often developing new recipes to fill in the gaps. And sheet pan pancake is something sort of like a, a bloggy, internet-y recipe that's kind of... I think crossed over to mainstream now, and so we. De- she said she wanted one, so we de- started developing one, and the development was going well. And I finally, you know, they were like, "Okay, we think it's ready for you to taste." I go out and taste it, and I just could not <laughs> believe what I was tasting. Look, look, look like it looked like focaccia. Mm-hmm. I could hold it in my hand. It's like it's thick. It's very sturdy. 
it was cold. Like I had no, I, I did what it, I was just like, what this is no, in no way is this a pancake. This, this I just had a <laughs> lot of trouble like thinking about that as a pancake and and really struggle with this. With like, we can't do it. this is this is not. It tasted good. I mean, it was fine, but it just didn't taste anything like a pancake. So. I finally did a little research at a deep dive into sheet pan pancakes, on, and I was like, okay, I guess this is what it, that's what it is. That's what a sheet pan pancake is. It's, it's savory? Not, it's something completely, uh, no, this, it has like jam running through it. Oh, this is like a river yeah. of jam. Cool. Yeah. But anyway, so it's turned out to be very popular, and to me, I'm like, I don't understand this at all, because yeah. why I want pancakes, this is not what I want. Yeah, but but there's clearly, a, people are, are searching for it and enjoy making it, mm-hmm. and I think for a family... I mean, my my sister has a few small kids, and I I could see them doing a sheet can sheet pan pancake really. Yeah, I think it's for for I think you just I think it's kind of sort of just about fooling kids. Like, <laughs> hey kid, this is a pancake. You get to eat yeah. it for breakfast, but it's got a ton of protein, and you can just eat it on the bus. I guess. What I about know. cuisines from other lands? Uh, international cuisines. Um, not using the the capital E word, um, but tell me what were some of the the flavors that you were you were working with this year that excited you. I mean, a lot of Indian flavors are what's exciting me personally, but also what I think is exciting a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people who are searching for recipes, I think they're being drawn to Indian food. Maybe they don't even know if they're being drawn to Indian food, but they're being drawn to spices. Like, you know, who would have thought that, like, turmeric is, like, going to be in everything if you put turmeric in anything? And I, I know I'm saying that sort of weirdly. Just lots of spice. I think people are just really into the idea of ground spices, putting um, coriander or cumin turmeric um any kind of blend i mean th- these things are just seem to be very popular and yeah putting them in any sort of cuisine sure. but i just think a lot of it's just based in uh indian you know savory yogurt you know marinating things in yogurt uh tons of beans you know lots of chickpeas so i mean they're just i just think those flavors coconut milk i mean all these yeah. things from indian food are just sort of everywhere in the uh recipe sphere yeah year. yeah in the in the world and the online cooking world and the, the online cooking front mm-hmm. yeah i totally agree i love tempered oils i love the i love cooking with indian flavors i love kerala i love the right. southern tip of india and those coconuts and and pork vindaloo i love i love cooking there's so home. much coconut everything and then yeah. also ghee i mean like the yep. fact that you can buy ghee at a lot of mm-hmm. uh kind of mainstream grocery stores now is Health very stores. different i couldn't do i couldn't when i was a kid that you wouldn't have ghee around couple more questions. You ended up making it to Chicago after your stint on Queer Eye. Right. You moved back um, and you became a restaurant critic. You were the critic for Time Out Chicago for years, along with Julia Kramer, who's now the editor-in-chief of Bon Apps. So you both are at... <laughs> she's not... The, don't say that. Adam will kill you. I know. <laughs> she's not I know. The, but she sort of is. Yeah. It was like a Freudian slip. Sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> Low-key. Just kidding. Love Adam Rapport. Um, honestly... Uh, you worked in you worked in Chicago as a critic. Um, what was that like? Like, what was Chicago like at the time? I mean, it was really it's an amazing restaurant city. It I got there at exactly the right time. It was such an amazing time. So the, I got there in 2015. I went to launch Time Out Chicago. So I was on the launch staff, and I stayed through the entire prime run for ten years, which is like who who does that anymore? Um, so. I think the second or third issue was uh, was the issue where we got to review Alinea because Alinea opened right when we were launching. And the way we reviewed it is we did a chart where we compared Alinea to uh, Avenues, which was Graham Elliott, Bo- Graham Elliott Bulls at the time, now Graham, now just Graham Elliott. Yeah, um, never got that one. Uh, Moto, which was Omar, um, Omar Con- uh, Cantu, uh I think we put Trotters in there. Like we t- kind of took these, like, all the people in Chicago who are doing this sort of avant-garde, if you will, work. What did we call it? I mean, edge Molecular, edge I guess. Edge cuisine? Edge Maybe that, that was what... Molecular I, gastronomy? Yeah, yeah. I think we call, Yeah, I, we had all these different all names these for names. it. So anyway, these... But, you know, Chicago was the center of that, and especially yeah. Alinea. Um, and so it was just a, really crazy to be covering Chicago for those 10 years and see how Alinea uh, influenced all... All these other chefs, not just in the city, but then in other mm-hmm. places. And it was cool to have other... I mean, Chicago for a while, it got really old, actually, after a couple of years. I was like, man, like, mm-hmm. is there another national magazine calling Chicago the restaurant city of the year? It's been like it's been the restaurant city of the year for like five years now, but there were so many stories. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that about Chicago. I feel like right now that's currently a little bit of almost like a backlash or just like a little bit of uh, like this kind of forgetting of Chicago with mm-hmm. Los Angeles being... The the yeah. the new one, the new hot the hot hot kid. So where did it go? It went from started for like Portland, Oregon, yeah, Chicago, L.A. I mean, 
no, San Francisco. No, Austin got a little love in Austin, there, but yeah, definitely sure. not as much as those three. Those yeah. are really... I feel like Portland, Maine, a little... Like oh, my last God. Last year, I got I, a little bit... Hard yeah. disagree. I'm sorry. I went there this summer. I love Maine, and I have friends who grew up there, but to call that the best restaurant city in America, I mean, that was that's a stretch, man. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Is that what Bon Appetit said? Yeah. This year? Okay. I guess yeah. so. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I I think there's a lot of great cities. I think Houston is probably going to be maybe the next one that I know the media's covered it. Interesting. Um, a little bit, right? I mean, they've yeah, certainly. I've, I've, I've written for Bon App, Actually, I wrote a story mm-hmm. for Andrew Knowlton about Houston, but I feel like that would be a wonderful thing for Houston to get as much love as L. A. is getting now. Mm-hmm. Would you think L. A. is a good restaurant town? It's the best. Oh, I, the I'm best. Totally agree. Okay, well, I will agree with you on this. If you think that's yeah. the best, and what you're saying is New York is not the best. No. And I will absolutely. I just think when I came here, it was funny because you mentioned Julia and I worked together. So we were co critics for a long time. Uh, and when she moved to New York before I moved back, so there were a few years when I was in Chicago, she was here. And I would just, you know, almost every time we talked or texted or emailed, it was just, she was just like, these restaurants are so bad. I can't believe people get out here. Like every restaurant in, Chicago, in New York is the worst, and I thought that was ridiculous. But it really, it, there's something about New York which just not. It's just not happening. It's not. We talked about in the podcast that we had Ruth Reichel on here a month or so ago, and she what does and she I, know. Yeah, what, what does Ruth what know? does Ruth know about New York? Oh my no. God, I, Matt, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm, we're doing a thing at Epi next in a few weeks. I was going to say next month, but it's December. Yeah. Where we are re- releasing all these these old gourmet recipes from the December 2009 issue, which was one that was never published. So these are the lost gourmet what a recipes. Cool idea. And I'm, it's like, this is the fact that I've gotten to deal with uh, Ruth a little Ruth bit in this. Great. She's Close just amazing. thought on Ruth. She was, um, and I were talking, we both agreed that just the rent and the and the real estate market in New York is, is making incredibly challenging mm-hmm. um, for, for startups, for small restaurants to launch without um, a lot of money. The way, and those are really kind of what the, some of the best ideas come from. The best restaurants come from very modest starts. And that's very impossible. It's almost impossible in New York mm-hmm. right now. So hopefully that will change. Um, to wrap it up, I wanted to hear um, a few of your favorite cookbooks from the year. Oh. You're, you have a What's lot. This on the list? It wasn't on the list. Okay. I said there'd be some surprises. Okay. Putting you on the spot, just a couple of your favorites. It won't be a definitive list. Okay. Things that – books that you've cooked from. You're, you're a huge cookbook fan. Yes. Not, it, you haven't just right, authored your right. own, but you have a huge collection. Yeah. What do you, what do you like to share? Um, there's a book – I know this is going to be bad because I don't know the author's name. But it, but it came on my radar recently. It's called Extra Helping, which I thought was it's such a cute little um, illustrated cookbook. It's very well written, and it's all about making food for people who are sick or who have just uh, had a loss in the family, or just basically for it's like when you need to like bring something over to someone who is going through a hard time. You know, it's something we all do. What's the food you should bring over? That I thought was a really great nice. idea for a couple. It's very sweet and it's not cloying at all. It's not cheesy. It's, it's done no, really it's well. No, it's very I, sincere. Um, all I remember is that Julia Tertian wrote the foreword, and I can't remember who yeah. wrote it. Well, we'll go look it, look it up. Yeah, look it up. Um, so I like that. Um, I uh, I thought Saladish was a good cookbook this year. Saladish. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that. Um, you know, there was a reissue of a great cookbook, Arthur Schwartz's How to uh, Cooking in a Small Kitchen, which is a great book uh, because he is so just like catty and bitchy. He's like, such, <laughs> such a great voice. And this book was written 30 years ago. And it's I think it's very apropos for the way people cook today in cities. Like, was our kitchens and our spaces are getting smaller and smaller. Always complaining. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. But making it work and <laughs> having wonderful meals there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and, man, I wish I had been prepared for this. Uh, okay. who, I don't know. Help me out. We just talked about this. What did we I say? We did, but that was off the podcast, <laughs> off the record. No, <laughs> but what did I say? We, do you remember? No, you you had a lot of good thoughts. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think Cook Ninety is probably going to be on mine. Thanks, man. That's I'm, very I'm, sweet. That That's that is sweet. that is like how we wrap it up here. David Tamarkin, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Thank you for having me. Here's Taste Editor Tatiana Bautista talking to Diane Chang. Diane Chang, welcome. It's great to have you on the Taste Podcast. Thank you. I'm really excited. So you're a caterer and you own a company called Eating Popoz. What's that like? Um, first of all, thank you so much for pronouncing that correctly. Yes, it's <laughs> Popoz, which means grandmother in Chinese. 
Um, what is it like? It's really fun. It's really, really, really hard. But overall, I think that it is something that I can't stop doing. Have you had any famous clients or crazy stories? <laughs> I have had some. <laughs> I've had some famous clients. Um, well, I wouldn't say that they're clients. I would say that they're more so people I just had an opportunity to cook for. It's not always consistent. I get booked for random jobs because a friend can't do it, or they find me at the last minute. Um, do you want to know who they are? Or uh, yeah, <laughs> if you're allowed to tell me, sure. I think I'm allowed to tell you. Um, I got a chance to private chef um, for Gwyneth Paltrow once at her house. Um, this was actually – I was considering a job at Goop. This is such a story I haven't really told anyone. And part of the, uh, I guess, preliminary exam, so to speak, was to cook at her apartment for her and her family. And that was so crazy because I was just in L.A. for vacation to visit my mom. I did not think that this would happen. And it was just me, her, her kids – um, just her family, and it was the most normal situation I'd ever been in, which is the crazy story. I would be freaking out if I were you. I was freaking out on my way there. My boyfriend drove me up to her house. I lost internet and phone cell signal completely. So in my head, I was like, okay, this is this is starting to get a little weird. But she's so nice. We didn't really chat that much because it's just, you know, you you have to be very professional. Mm -hmm. um, her kids were incredibly nice. They ate pretty much everything I cooked, which was, again, a fear of mine. You read all these stories about her not eating this, not eating that, but they were so gracious and just loving and normal. Well, normal as normal can be. Um, so that was one of those I don't know why I haven't told anyone. I think it's just because it was such a normal experience and regular day for me. But when I think back, I just can't believe that happened. <laughs> for sure. So what did you end up making? Oh, my gosh. Um, so I had heard that they really – well, okay. So there were some specifics um, about – Things that she just – it's not that she won't eat these things. She just isn't particularly a huge fan of certain dishes, which I can understand. I, I have those predilections also. But uh, she doesn't love a quinoa salad because I think every personal chef that comes in cooks her a quinoa salad. That's a classic healthy move. <laughs> They're like, she's Try going this to great her, She's going to eat quinoa. Mm -hmm. Um, so I avoided that, but I made this um, – I actually cooked a lot of Asian things. Um, I made like a um, fish sauce chicken with uh, uh, shishito pepper, like ground dried shishito peppers and lemon. I made a Chinese noodle salad, which I was freaked out about because I'm like, they're not going to eat noodles. They ate noodles. Um, and then a uh, daikon soup. I made a salad. Gosh, I can't even really remember. Wow. I just made a ton of stuff and desserts, probably. And I burned something, too. So, But it all it all worked out. <laughs> yes, it did. And so you also have a bit of a food, um, a background in food writing. So how has that impacted where you are now? I feel very blessed to have had that experience uh, because at the time, so I initially started off as an editorial assistant at Bon Appetit magazine when it was still in L.A., and at the time, it was difficult because there weren't a lot of editorial jobs in L.A. I didn't know how deeply involved I wanted to be um, in food. And it wasn't that cool at the time it, to work at in food. You know, it wasn't right. like it is now because of social media. And um, I, it was like the painstaking process of fact-checking and um, just – research and and you know copy editing and styling recipes i actually didn't really get to write until the last year i was there so a lot of it was it felt like an internship and i even helped my editor move books from one room to another <laughs> thinking that i would get promoted immediately <laughs> after that that is a very important task <laughs> that's so. an important task instead i got a gift certificate <laughs> it was all good but um now Looking back, you know, my job is so inconsistent. I'm such a small business and I am financially responsible for myself and people I employ. And also it's just expensive living in New York and running a business. So a lot of times I have to pick up writing jobs. If not for that editorial experience, I probably would not 
be able to do what I'm doing now because a lot of the side jobs I have is styling recipes, um, creating recipes, writing content. So, yeah. Yeah, so you've always had been sort of incorporating f- uh, your past as a food writer and also with what you're doing now. It seems like you're all covered. I'm trying. I, I think um, – I used to blog about food and I just in my head I was like this is going nowhere this is what I'm doing cuz I'm bored and I've nothing else to do and it's actually created a connection for me and other people that I've now I now have in my life which is funny I've met some people through the internet <laughs> Yeah you have to start somewhere <laughs> Yeah and I I feel really lucky to have had that experience And you've mentioned that a big source of inspiration for the food that you make is comfort food but Comfort food is something that's really personal and different for each person. So, how does this come into play when you're conceptualizing menus? I think a lot of people who reach out to me know that like I cook a certain type of food. They've seen it, they've it's a word of mouth thing. Right now, that's how I'm getting a lot of the gigs. So, they kind of know what to expect already and they know there's always going to be some kind of an Asian slant because that is the These are the flavors that I'm very familiar with. I grew up in a predominantly Asian neighborhood. My parents are and I I'm, I'm speaking very pan Asian about pan Asia because I love mo- like almost all Asian cuisines. And and I'm not going to try to cook something that I don't really feel like I understand. Not that I don't want to challenge myself, but it's more so I want to feel like I'm presenting myself and I'm presenting my food as authentically as possible, um which can be problematic too. But I think um in terms of what's comforting to me oftentimes feels like it's comforting for the person who reaches out because they already kind of know what to expect. Right. There's all there's always that immediate connection of if you're reaching out to me then you're already kind of on this base level of understanding each other it seems absolutely and i think that's what kind of makes what i do a little different from what people do at restaurants or maybe what people do at huge catering companies and um in many ways it's prevented me from expanding as quickly or as much as i want to but i i really love where i'm at right now i love being so proud of the food i make and i love having a very personal connection with the person i work with which sounds really silly and idealistic um especially when the rents do but it hasn't failed me yet and i feel like there's so much room for these kind of personal connections through food yeah in yeah. a non cheesy way <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure So you mentioned that a lot of people already know what your food looks like before they reach out to you and that a lot of people reach out to you through word of mouth. And so I actually found you through Instagram. And on your Instagram, of course you post all the food that you're making for these events and these clients, but also what you're making at home. <laughs> yes. And I wanted to shout out this one thing that I saw recently <laughs> okay. that looked really good. Cool. It was hoji cha buckwheat oat pancakes with matcha maple syrup. and topped with roasted plums and orange zest. And I saw that it looked so good. I saw you also had a recipe for it. I haven't tried it yet, but I will. And I wanted to ask, do you always feel like when you're um when you're cooking at home, does it feel like you're practicing or recipe testing for an event or do you have recipes that you just want to keep for yourself? I think so it's funny you should mention. Yes, um I get a lot of am I allowed to say shit? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I get a lot of <laughs> shit. <laughs> Sorry. Um <laughs> I get a lot of shit from from friends who desperately want to see me grow my business in a certain direction for being so personal with my Instagram because as you see um I post a lot of just stuff about my life on there. And I think that um I don't hold back because I think, you know, with me you kind of get it all and it's the same with the food. I I'm not always really recipe testing for events. In fact, I don't at all. Um a lot of times things come up in my mind and I I always tell clients I'm like, you know, really depends on seasonality. So if I'm not getting a certain vegetable that I told you that was on the menu, I'm going to find something that's just as delicious. So it's hard for me to really recipe test. So a lot of times what I post on my Instagram in terms of like my breakfast or my lunch. It's really something I've cooked for myself because I'm having a down day or I'm going through stuff or I just feel really happy and in that particular case, 
I had a pint of hoji cha tea powder I made for something, and I just it really bugged me that it was sitting there <laughs> and not being used. And I just felt like pancakes that day. I really just was like, it's. I think it was raining, maybe. I don't know what kind of day it was, but I just wanted to nourish myself, and it worked out because. We met that way, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I feel like my leftover meals definitely don't look like that. So you're giving I'm, me some inspiration. I'm sure, I'm sure it can. I spend quite a bit of time making sure the light's right and that it looks good. So Yeah, and then there's the stack on the side that doesn't look as good. But then you end up eating that one, right? Yeah. I oh, Yeah, it's like by the time I get to the things I take pictures of, it's so embarrassing. It's cold. So when friends come over before, if I've made an effort to make it look nice... I'm like, you guys, wait, stop. I need to take photos. And they're just like, all right, the meal's going to be cold. All good. <laughs> they know what to expect. So speaking of having friends come over, you're probably the best dinner guest and also dinner host. So do you have any go-tos when you're invited to potlucks? Or what's your process when you have people over? Um, I'm the worst dinner guest because if I'm invited to dinner, that means I don't have to bring anything. (laughs) It's the one time I don't have to cook. Um, No, I actually, I love making desserts um, when I go over to people's homes um, or salads because I feel like usually the, the host has got the main thing covered. And I don't want to interrupt that flow of, you know, flavors and dishes. So for me, a salad's super easy because depending on what's going on, um, you can gussy up the dressing like, oh, I want to make it kind of, you know, slightly more Asian. I'll add some sesame oil, rice vinegar, whatever. Or uh, I have mustard. It's it's easy to hack together. Um, But go-to dishes when people come over. I love making um, lunch or breakfast. I think that those are things that a lot of times people have to pay to do to go out and eat. Um, And not everyone wants to spend the time to make themselves this like hearty, fancy breakfast. So polenta is a great thing or congee. I love to do a good Asian breakfast Um, and waffles. Like who doesn't want to eat waffles? (laughs) Right. And I have a tiny waffle maker I got at TJ Maxx. So I want to use as much as possible. Yeah. Not everyone has a waffle maker. Exactly. And it's something so simple. But when people see that you make it at home, it's super special. The only problem is keeping them warm. (laughs) That's true because it's only one at a time. Right. However many are in there. Right. Besides catering and larger events uh, and doing pop-ups, you also make custom cakes, which you've mentioned. Um, For one of my friends, you actually made this lemon poppy seed cake with olive oil, and it had black sesame, cashew frosting, kumquat jam, dehydrated berries, all these really cool things. And this was not your average birthday cake that that had yellow cake and chocolate frosting. So what's your inspiration behind all of these cakes that you make? Because on Instagram, they're so beautiful and colorful. They have, are they edible flowers and leaves? And they just look so different from the cakes that I see in bakeries. Thank you. Um, I I kind of make things that I, I like to eat. So I think a lot of times um, I do a lot of custom cakes with flavors I've never even tried yet. And I think that's the fun part is I get to work with people generally who are so open-minded. Like, I have never had someone reach out about a birthday cake who is just like, I don't want this. I don't want this. Sometimes they'll tell me certain flavors they love. So if they love citrus flavors, then I get to play with whatever citrus fruits are on hand. Um, If they like chocolate, I'll focus more on things that might go well with chocolate. And if they don't have any option or any idea, I will defer to my favorite flavors, which is always black sesame. (laughs) So, um, yeah, it's, you know, a lot of it is just like, I like to sketch out my cakes. And I think that's what makes it fun is um, I get to see color wise, like what it'll look like. I get a lot of inspiration from Instagram, from the internet, from savory foods, from Chinese desserts, um, from Filipino desserts. Actually, I made like a, 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 Uh, purple yam cake and it Mm. had all this like stuff coconut you know and um as far as flowers go i don't always use edible flowers if i can get some i have a a good friend who's a florist and he grows like 
shiso and all this great edible stuff and he'll always have something that he'll tell me is edible i hope and i'll get flowers from him but otherwise um i love going to the bodega and getting flowers i rescue flowers from events and i always preface this is not edible unless (laughs) you dare (laughs) it could be right um and as far as dehydrated fruits go i just like how it's crunchy and it's like a textural thing instead of nuts Sometimes it adds, like, just a different look. So a lot of it is, you know, I'm a very visual person, um, and I have a hard time being minimalist. I really try. Like, that's the problem is I wish I was minimalist, and then I look at my cake, and I was like, shit, it's nowhere near minimal. It's, like, the most gaudy, like, No, but it's your signature. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I'm known for God. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, I, I love them because you have all these really beautiful pastels and with the buttercream and then you have these fruits on top. And it, it's just it's so colorful, but it also looks super natural. And it's all healthy for you. I mean, it's not healthy, healthy. As far as desserts go. As far as desserts go, I don't use any refined sugar. It's a big, big thing for me i never use it not in anything not in pickling even if i have to make a white cake it's i'm very hard pressed to like have to use white sugar just because of my grandmother's influence but also i have a lot of like health i've had a lot of health issues in the past and dental issues and a lot of it stems from my research and like white sugar so for me that means how to like you know it forces me to think outside of the box in terms of sweetening things which is why there are the usages of different types of fruit and things like that. So a lot of it is just out of necessity. And uh, yeah, I've noticed that a lot of the frosting that you make is usually vegan. I've seen a lot of cashew frosting. So how does that work? I've never made frosting with cashews. Um, It's actually super easy. Um, So the reason why I started even making cashew frosting is because I don't necessarily do the best with dairy. Um, I can eat it, and I do indulge, um, but I have a lot of friends who actually can't at all. And so for certain birthdays, I it, to me, it just bothered me that I'd go to a certain vegan bakery to get a friend a cake, and their frosting was, like, filled. I mean, it's dairy-free, but it's filled with just processed, you know, like, fake butter and all this stuff to help stabilize it. And um, I made a cashew pudding once. And, you know, I'm not, like, the first one to come up with a cashew frosting. But I was like, whoa, this tastes like frosting. And so I started doing that. And it's just so simple. You just take cashews, you soak it. It's like making cashew milk, Mm -hmm. except you're not blending it with water. You put it in the food processor and literally adding, like, you can add coconut milk to kind of make it a a smoother consistency and any, you know— seasonings that you want but it's my it's my go-to and it doesn't melt you know yeah, i'm wondering about the consistency if it's is it like a light whipped sort of consistency it's, or it's not like buttercream so it's not gonna be fluffy but it's kind of like a um like a butter sugar frosting okay it's, it's got that same sort of thickness mm-hmm. so it's never gonna be light and airy it's always gonna be dense and my cakes are dense i always tell people who think that just because it's gluten-free or vegan or whatever or dairy-free, they always think that it's, oh, it's low-fat. And I'm like, no. there. I mean, it's made with coconut milk. There are nuts in it. I use nut flours, buckwheat flour, rice flour. Um, there are starches. But for me, it's like if you're going to have to choose between eating a cake with no nutritional value and a cake with some nutritional value, that's still good. Mm-hmm. And also, I also hate that, like, when people think about uh, wheat-free cakes or vegan cakes, their immediate th- thought is like, oh, it's really dry. So on my website, I don't even know if I still write this on it, but I used to, just in selling cakes, I would write, it's so moist or something. <laughs> and people would write in, they're like, I hate that word, but... That's the best way to describe that, cake, because yeah. nobody wants a dry cake. <laughs> nobody wants a dry cake. I've had so much dry cake, and I love cake, so... So for me, the cashew frosting is great also because it's just so rich. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily expect that when you're using words like vegan, gluten-free. And I feel like so many people have, like you mentioned, these misconceptions about 
what dessert looks like or, you know, you can't fully indulge or enjoy it the same way as you would have, you know, a non-vegan food. Well, I think that there is such a trend around this stuff right now. And and it's interesting because a lot of people are shying away from just eating whole foods because they want to make a statement about how they feel towards this movement, this trend of being gluten-free or or whatever, you know. But to me, it's not about being gluten-free. If you're gluten intolerant and you have celiac, fine. For me, on a personal level, um, I just know from my research how wheat is processed and made in the United States and grown and all sorts of, you know, it's, we have a very complex food system here. And I'm not saying that you should never eat this stuff because I will definitely go ham on a bowl of noodles anytime, wheat noodles. Mm-hmm. But it's more so that, you know, if I have the option to cook with things that, especially with savory foods, if I can get it from the farmer's market and by the way, it's not always expensive. There are if you go late enough, they have ugly vegetables that they'll sell for half the price, and that's what I always do, even for catering. Um, yeah, it's just a different way of cooking and thinking about food, and it doesn't have to be trendy. I don't think color like there's another thing with like oh, eating things that are colorful is also a trend right now. Mm-hmm. But you know, especially in Asian culture and Chinese culture, eating colorful foods. For your meal is it's a health thing. It's right. having, as you know, it having a little bit of color on your on your plate is the well roundedness of your diet, mm-hmm. and all about that balance that so much of Chinese culture is about. Yeah, and Chinese medicine speaks to that too. So color is also visual. You know, it's a visual eating is a visual experience. So or just fully sensory. So I feel like, you know, you get more of that when you use natural foods. And there's so much color, period. Why wouldn't we use it? Why wouldn't we use natural sugars? Why wouldn't we use things that aren't as processed? I don't know. Plus, just, it'll look good on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> and FYI. Added, added bonus, always. <laughs> and you get likes. <laughs> if if nothing else, just do it for <laughs> the likes. nothing else, sure. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take it. And so for our last question, I wanted to ask... What's your dream cookbook? Funny you should ask. <laughs> um, I'm actually working on one right oh. now. Um, I actually am. Um, and I I have yet to start, but I'm working with this great, um, this gal named Claire who found me on Instagram also. And she's just, she's been really supportive and, and I guess following some of my work for a little bit and was like, hey, this would be great for a cookbook. And she works with a publisher or an agency. I can't remember which one. But um, I've had a really hard time thinking about it because I think the cookbook I want to produce is, to me, it's not something anyone would be into. And I think that's the problem. And maybe that's what's holding me back. But who knows? Maybe someone might be into it. But I want it to be like a self-help cookbook. Um, And it's very personal. Like, I want to offer especially young women. I'm in my early 30s. But I definitely feel like food and cooking and that whole experience of, like, taking care of yourself through food really supported me through my 20s. I had a pretty rough time in my 20s, as most of us do. Currently currently in that situation oh, now. Well, yes. it gets better, <laughs> because, especially with food. Not that, not that you should eat yourself <laughs> eat yourself to, to happiness, but <laughs> I think um, taking that extra step to making yourself dinner, even for one, even as you see, I do really elaborate meals, even if it's just for myself. And it's not for Instagram. That is how I normally eat. Because I feel like, why wouldn't you take care of yourself, you know? And if you can't afford therapy yet, like, it's a great way of, like, spending the extra time and money to make yourself feel good and look better and taste things that are good to you. So I do want it to be kind of self-helpy, little bits and pieces of relationship stuff. I don't know. We'll see. That's and, awesome. And the cool illustrations, because I know a lot of awesome illustrators, also young Asian women illustrators who are just doing such amazing work. I love drawing also. I don't know. Maybe I'll need, like, help from you. Who knows? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> well, that sounds awesome. Thank you so much for being on the Taste Podcast, Diane. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.
The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>